I have to say that it is always interesting when you are speaking to somebody that you feel that you already know, even though it's the first time that we've met. And the reason I say that is uh, I, have, I have grown up with Kim, not directly, but um, indirectly I have grown up. Now, I've grown up with Kim because he has been in my life and he has been a TV star that's influenced me going forward. He has been in my bedroom, he's been in my lounge, and that's because he is probably my favorite wildlife filmmaker and photographer who has graced us with incredible images, productions, and intimate moments with some of the wildest animals that Africa has to. So, Kim Walhota, thank you so much for joining, and I am shaking with not only excitement, but also about what my son's gonna ask you in a bit. Uh, how's it, Mark? Thank you, and uh, yeah, I'm also, Getting ready to run when those questions come from your son. Can you hear me, Kim? I can, and I. Can you not hear me? Can you hear no, me? No. Hello? Do I need to do anything here? I haven't changed anything. Why can't you hear me? Live Facebook recording. Uh. No, it should all be there. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. I can hear you perfectly. Okay, I can't hear you. Let's see. Let's see what's going on this side. So, oh, ah, there we go. Why has that changed? I haven't done anything. No, you're back again. Oh, my back. Okay, good. Fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm going to start again so you can hear me and then we can actually have a conversation. <laughs> right, I'm still here. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Today, I am so excited to be joined by somebody who I feel I've known for the last 20 years, um, even though it's the first time we've met, because Kim has been in my lounge, he's been in my bedroom, he's been with me as I've gone into the bush and he's been in something that's driven me to go forward. You see, he is probably, he is the and my favorite wildlife filmmaker and photographer. And the reason he's that is he's the person who gets up close and personal. He takes us to places that not many other people get the privilege to go. So Kim, it's an absolute pleasure to finally meet you. Uh, and I cannot wait to, to learn about your story and see how you're going to squirm, squirm when my 10 year old son gives him, gives you a full debrief. Thanks, Mark. I will be squirming, but uh, I do have an out, so I might have to use it. Uh, the satellite phone, the satellite signal doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> I have a river down here, I'll bolt. <laughs> Um, I love, I went, obviously did some research and went onto your, your website and for anyone who hasn't been onto Kim's website, the first thing you see is something that just stops you dead in your tracks, which is I've got, I've got dogs, I've got animals, I've got pets. Now these are the pets I love stroking and scratching. And the great thing about my pets is they don't have a jaw and a crushing potential that, that your animal does that you stroke. So the fact that I have dogs and you seem to have the same relationship with a predator, um, how do you get that connection with a hyena that allows you to scratch behind its ear? I think maybe you should ask them that, not me. <laughs> I've got a very strong jaw as well. <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, it was never, it was never something that I, I planned to do. Um, you know, I got into filmmaking and, you know, we're always trying to, to film at the animal's eye level because that really engages the audience. You feel like you're a part of it and you get in there. So to do that, you've got to get out the car. And the more I got out the car, and I'm working with these animals for 18 months to two years, the more I get out the car, they get used to me and then they get curious and they come and they interact and, and it just happens. And it's a very natural process. That's the beauty of it. It's not, I mean, I have specific rules and one of them is that 
him to decide if they want to engage with me. And so, you know, I was, the first time it happened, I was at Mala Mala doing a film on hyenas. And I was sitting there on the ground and this, this youngster approached me and I thought, now what do I do? Do I get in the car or do I sit it out? And for some reason that day, I decided to sit it out. And she came up to me and I, I held out my hand sort of gingerly, not knowing if she was going to leave with my finger or what. And instead of, I expected her to either bite my hand or lick it or something, but she didn't do that. She put her chin on my hand and put pressure on it <laughs> and sort of inviting contact. So I gingerly started scratching her under the chin and she lifted her chin up like this. Oh, I love that. And she just wanted more. And from that day on, every day I got out the car, she came for scratches, which was unbelievable. And I, I couldn't understand it. And then I developed a relationship with the whole pack or the whole clan. And it was amazing. And I've now gone on to do that with um, cheetahs, hyenas in another two in Botswana and here now in Zimbabwe. I'm, on, I'm now based on Sango Wildlife Conservancy here in Zimbabwe. And these hyenas have been unbelievable. I go walking in the bush and out of nowhere will come eight or 10 hyenas to come and say, how's it? And to come and play and we roll around and it's, it's insane. I can't believe it. I don't understand it. I don't know how it happens. Um, I think a lot of it is to do with how you approach them. You've got to, you've got to be confident and you've got to understand their body language and you've got to put across a body language that they understand as well. So it's a lot of little subtleties and I can't explain them. They just happen. Um, and, you know, another thing, and one of my other rules is I never carry a weapon. And that's pretty key to the whole thing because when you carry a weapon, you, you're really arrogant in the way that you walk and the way you approach any animal. And they pick that up. They pick up that arrogance and they won't come near you. And anyway, what right do I have to shoot an animal if I've overstepped the mark? Yeah. So, no, I never carry a weapon. And the other rule is I never feed them. Food changes that whole dynamic and causes all sorts of problems. So your relationship with your dog and cat will never be like my relationship with the hyenas. Not because they're wild, but because I never feed them. And I don't have to feed them. So my relationship with these animals is purely love and affection. Yours, probably 90% is to do with food and then they might love you afterwards. Yeah. So mine is a very, a very different thing. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's insane. And so natural. That's what I find the beauty of it. I think we used to do this, you know, thousands of years ago when we roamed the plains with these animals. We used to walk with them and play with them and do all that stuff. And I just think we got, it's just taking us back to our past where we used to be. We, we've now become so terrified of everything that um, we don't want to step out of our vehicle into this wildness, which is insane because I go jogging out here just about every day, keeping fit and stuff. It's not a problem. There are times when you have a problem and the key to that is how do you react to that problem? That's the key when you do pick up and, and that takes experience and time and whatever. So I'm not saying just go out there and do this at home. It, it's taken many years of experience. It's, I didn't, start off doing this in my filming career it wasn't the way we made films but it's slowly progressing to that and for for me this beautiful natural world around us yeah it's phenomenal and one of one of the questions that my son had for you he said he asked the question which you've you've, you've touched on there is how does it feel when you get so close up to an animal and how do you know it won't bite you well, it feels, I mean, it's, it's just to be accepted by them and it's a mutual thing. You know, you respect them, they'll respect you back and you've got to have the same, everything you do towards them, they will reciprocate and you've got to just maintain that. But whether they're going to bite you or not, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> and you rely a lot I mean, like I say, that first incident with the hyena that came up for scratches, I didn't know what she was going to do. This morning, I was walking with the matriarch, and uh, you'll see the video, and I put it up later. She, I put one up yesterday where she wanted to sort of play with me, but the one from today 
it's insane. She's jumping around her head, you know, playing like this and going crazy. And she keeps coming back to me. She just wants to play, but I don't know whether she will bite me or not. I still don't know that. <laughs> yeah. And I, so, so we, we both are unsure of that, that, that position. And, you know, how do we take it from there? It's a, it's a tricky one and it's going to take a lot of time to try and work it out and understand it. But so tell your son not to try this at home, not just yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet. We'll work up towards that over a few years. Um, but you have <laughs> another secret weapon, don't you, which is, is that you walk barefoot in, in everything you do. Do you think that's a, a big key thing as well for you? I think it is important, yeah. And that's why I do it. Is it firstly, it makes me more grounded and... and makes me feel what these animals are going through i'm part of the system i'm part of the habitat um you know when you wear shoes you're very aggressive in the way that you walk you know you just crunch over everything when i'm barefoot i'm conscious of every step because there's lots of little thorns lurking out there and all of that um but it definitely does ground you and you know sometimes in the heat of the day you'll wonder why the cheetah went that way and not this way but you go and walk there, you find out very quickly. But if you had shoes on, you have no idea. And it's either because it's extremely hot or because there's thorns there or something. So it's just becoming a part with them. And then with hyenas, if you wear shoes, they will eat them. And this is the problem because you're put inside. <laughs> so, you know, with my clothes, so I normally have my sleeves rolled up and a hyena will come and bite my arm, but gently. If there's clothes there, he'll bite hard and try and pull them off. So they know the difference. And if he's biting my arm, I can go out from those. And, you know, if there's something underneath there, well, it's not going to be too sweet. So, yeah, if I had shoes on, they will eat them. And, you know, shoes in this type of habitat, in this type of environment, they don't smell too good either. So probably something a hyena would love to get hold of. <laughs> Smelly feet and shoes are, are not a good mix yeah. in the bush. Yes. My, so my son is, is absolutely a mad soccer fan and his dream is to become a footballer. But I, I think if that doesn't come to fruition, I've got a feeling he's going he's gonna to get into the outdoors. And he was wondering what inspired you to become a ranger that you did at the start. So what, what was that journey like? Well, for me, the journey, I've, I've had a really lucky break all the way through so my grandfather was the first game ranger in the kruger national park and he's a national legend for having killed an adult male lion with a knife after it pulled him from his horse that is such a so good that's a bit of yeah i mean it's, it's an insane story and it's the only bit of knife law coming out of africa <laughs> and you know to kill an adult male lion like that is, is quite something. And I remember then, the first time I heard that. My story. dad. I was um, a, a young, yeah. eight year old British guy coming across to South Africa for the first time. I went to the Kruger. And you know, when you hear these stories and you're going, that's got to be a myth. It's, it's got to be an urban bush myth that this happened. And now I get to speak to, to the grandson of that story. So, do you mind just giving it just for the guys? Because most of our, America, our audience are in America. Um, and don't quite know what that feels like to be in the bush on your foot. And do you mind just giving that story a little bit of flavor for our, our American friends? Uh, yeah, definitely. So this happened in 1903. And in those early days, they used to do patrols on horseback in the Kruger National Park. And my grandfather, the way he worked, he would go out on horseback and then he would have a number of scouts with pack donkeys with all his camping gear. And they'd go to an area, they'd set up camp, and then he would patrol the area for a week or so till he had covered the whole area. And then they'd pack up camp and go to another place, set up camp and do the same again. And it was one of these times when they were moving camp and he was riding ahead of his guys. It was late afternoon and he was riding along and he heard this noise in front of him in the long grass and he thought, oh, it's just some reba. And the next thing he saw these two male lines beaming down on him. So he spun his horse around, dug in his spurs and tried to take off. And as he did that, one of the lions landed on the back of the horse. The horse reared up, he fell off to the side 
the second male lion was coming around the side to grab the horse by the throat and he fell right in front of it. So the lion just grabbed him by the shoulder and dragged him off. And so there my grandfather, he's got the lion biting him on the right shoulder here. He's on his back and he's just being dragged along by this huge beast. His rifle's gone, it's fallen off somewhere there. And um, all he had on him was his knife on his side, but he had, he had to be very careful now not to arouse the lion that he was still alive because then it would just drop him and crunch his head in and that would be game over. So very, very slowly, he got his hand round behind his back, got the knife out, brought it up under its chest and he gingerly felt where the body parts were. And then very quickly, he gave it three quick stabs. The third stab was in the jugular and the lion dropped him and walked off and he could hear it, hear it dying. And I have, actually have a recording of him telling the story. And he says he got up and he said to this lion, come back and he swore at it like he's never sworn in his life before. <laughs> he told the lion he wasn't finished. <laughs> anyway, the lion didn't come back, luckily. <laughs> but he knew the other lion wouldn't catch, wouldn't catch the horse. So he managed to climb in the tree with one arm because this right arm now is buggered. And he tied himself in the tree with his belt because he was losing a lot of blood. He was worried he would faint. And then the lion came back. It was now dark. He heard the lion come back and it came to the tree where he was. And it would try and climb the tree. But the, the dog that ran off with the horse came back because he realized he wasn't on the horse anymore. The dog came back. And each time the lion tried to climb the tree, he set the dog on it. And he managed to prevent the lion climbing. And then he heard his scouts coming and he shouted at them to fire a few shots. And they chased the lion away. They got him out the tree. And he says they walked something like six miles that night to a hut that he knew of from the Boer War days. Excuse me. And um, so they spent the night there. In the morning, he couldn't move. He couldn't get up. He couldn't crawl. He couldn't do anything. But he said to the guys, he said, he sent two of them. He said, go back to where you found me, follow my blood trail. And then you'll get to a place where there's lots of blood and follow that blood trail and you'll find a dead lion. <laughs> of course, they thought he had lost the plot that he was delirious and whatever. Anyway, and he said to them, when you get there, please skin it and bring me the skull. Which they did. They found the lion. They brought back the skull and the skin. They also brought back the heart because it stabbed it twice in the heart and the third blow was in the jugular. And so the following day, they, he got them to make a stretcher with a blank, two poles and a blanket, and they carried him for four days to hospital. He got malaria on the way, and gangrene was setting in when he got to the hospital, but they managed to save his arm, and all he was worried about was being able to get a rifle up there again, which he was able to do. And he went on to serve 44 years in the... Uh, you know, I tell everybody that, well, I, I, I love telling his story, but also I love to tell everybody that he's my grandfather. And whenever I get a job interview, I first tell them who my grandfather is, because then I'll get the job. <laughs> it seems to be. <laughs> my first job was, the only reason I got my very first job was because of my grandfather. Nothing to do with me. Really? I had no track record. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I take full advantage of it. Might as well. It's obviously a, a good way to, to get into the, into the business, if you call it, or get into the bush. That must be such an inspiration for you now. Uh, it is. No, very much so. I, I thank him for all of that. And then you know, my dad was a head ranger in Kruger as well. So there is a bit of family history all the way there. I've never worked in Kruger. Um, maybe one day when I'm big. <laughs> One day. Well, let, let's, let's move a little bit onto your work because your work is absolutely incredible. Um, you have a very different style, which we'll, we'll touch base on, but um, just, I'm just, you, you touched on earlier about how you create that, um, that bond between the animals, that trust between the two that allows you to, to film in the intimate way that you do. Is that, is that time? Is it the eye level that you talked about earlier? Is it, uh, an innate thing that you have that with the animals? Do you, do you look at the animals and work out which pack or which pride or which clan you feel is, is the one that you're going to bond most with? What's that? How does that journey happen? Because you, you take years to, to do your films, don't you? 
Yeah, so that's, I work differently to, to most wildlife filmmakers. You know, I know the BBC, when they do a one hour production, they probably film for seven months in total, but two years. I like to go into a place and film for two years solid. And then I develop, because I've had so much time with these animals, a relationship develops with them. Um, but how, you know, I don't, I, I do see, you know, I bump into this animal, that animal, and I see something and I'll spend, you know, maybe go back the next day. Oh, that's great. We develop that. And then, it, and so it goes on. Um, and also I'm very careful not to think that because I was able to do this with these animals over here, it doesn't mean I can do the same with these animals here because they could, they, there are many different factors that could affect their behavior and, and their behavior towards me. So it's, it's, you know, I, I go here now, I'll go tomorrow morning and I'll get out and walk with those hyenas without even thinking about it. But if I went to a new place, it would take months before I even think of doing that. I wouldn't just get out and think, oh, I can do this. Mm -hmm. But I, I do believe I have some innate thing in me that allows me to, to develop these relationships. Um, and it's, there, there's definitely something there, but more of it, I think, is an understanding of of animal behavior and and being able to read that behavior, because I, as I was saying earlier, that I, I do it with utmost confidence, and confidence is a big thing, because animals can read your non-confidence in a, in a very, in incredibly subtle ways that we'll never understand. I always tell about the story about a horse by the name of Hans in the Second World War. Now, Hans could do arithmetic. <laughs> and this was in, in Germany. And the owner of Hans would have an audience and he would write a sum on the board, two plus one equals. And then Hans would tap the floor so many times with the right answer. And the scientist picked up on this. He thought, no, there's no ways. I mean, some of our kids can't even do that. So he went and... Um, got the guy and said, can we take the audience away? So they took the audience away and Hans couldn't get the right answer. So the scientist realized obviously that the horse is reading something in people's expression or body language or whatever it was that's making the horse, that's telling him when to stop tapping. So the scientist then went and put himself in the audience, just himself. Now he knows that the horse is looking for some cue. So he tried to act as dead pan as possible and the horse got it right. So our behaviors are so incredibly subtle that we will never understand. And these animals pick that stuff up. So if you're not confident in your heart, I mean, your confidence has got to come from the heart, not from it be fine. That doesn't work because your heart's still going to be thumping and going crazy. Yeah. Um, so it's got to come from there. And that for me has just come over time doing this more and more and getting to understand and read situations. And so that's, that's how I get there. But it's, you know, there are very few professions where you are allowed the time to, you know, suspend that amount of time with an animal and actually be paid to do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the beauty of filming. Yeah. You're, you're every, you're everyone's dream job, isn't it? Um, but it's, yeah. incredible. it's incredible. I did um, about 18 months ago, I did uh, the Primitive Trail, which is a, a beautiful hike through Umfalozi. Um, but obviously we do, we do with two game rangers and sleeping outside. But we had a, a nice in interesting issue where we got charged by a white rhino. And it was, it's, it's interesting, but that happened quite early on. And like you said, the confidence of you getting through something like that and understanding and observing the behaviors by day four and day five you have a completely different way about you in the bush the way you hear sounds the way you react to certain things it's, it's spectacular um, yeah i think I, I think that's a problem with 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 the world today is we've just become and you know that's something i'm always trying to press and you know i believe that showing what i do tries to impress that on people is that we've lost our connection with the natural world. And that's why when your first day out, you have no idea what's going on. You've lost, you have no connection. 
and then you, you you very quickly learn what's happening and how to read it and understand it and we've got to get back to that because if we lose all connection imagine if people never had access to any of that and all we did we were around people all the time and cars and cell phones and cities and everything we'll eventually kill each other i mean that'll be the end of us so we we we've got to realize that we're a part of this natural world we've got to save this natural world and um and enjoy it and and you know revitalize our souls try and do that every day if you can yeah it's beautiful at the moment where you're obviously we're with most of the world on lockdown and and you're seeing you're seeing nature recover you're seeing i love seeing some of those satellite images of how the world is recovering and seeing animals in different parts of cities and areas that you've never seen before it's 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 really, I love it. I love it. Uh, Apart from the, the I, monkeys, yeah, yeah. I've got issues in my house at the moment. <laughs> yeah, we, we have monkey and baboon issues here as well. <laughs> okay. um, but I read one, there's one interesting one that you, you were talking about senses and you're talking about confidence. I understand you had, you had one issue with a, a leopard uh, which charged you, which you, you developed quite a brave technique around how to avoid that charge well yeah i don't know if it's a tick it's i learned that from um but i you know i this leopard had a kill i've been working with her for a couple of months and she had two cubs they were i think about four months old at the time four or five months and she had a kill in the tree mother was lying on the anthill and the cubs were playing and um my card broken down the clutch wasn't working so i had to get out to try and sort it out so i got out and i kept an eye on the mother and she wasn't hassled with me she just lay there i managed to get in there sort it out and the next thing the cubs were two meters away from me and i thought oh tomorrow i've got to get out the car and get these nice low angle shots and do all of that so lo and behold tomorrow came and she was lying on the anthill the cubs were playing got out of the car with the camera tripod and I was walking towards the cubs and before I knew it here was a mother leopard protecting her cubs flying at me at full charge probably the most hairy thing that you can have come at you and I seen how leopards will you know charge at hyenas when they come and try and steal their kills and stuff and the hyenas just ignore them. They just carry on sniffing around as if there's no leopard anywhere in sight. <laughs> so I had to try and do the same. And uh, I, I had to break eye contact, which was, which was critical, and sort of look around. I held my camera and tripod up here to give me some protection. And then she stopped. She probably stopped oh, less than 10 meters away. And she stood there growling at me. And I wasn't, you know, I just like looking out the corner of my eye and then she walked off back to her anthill and after that she charged me again i don't know three or four times but every time i knew i knew what it was about how to handle it and that it wasn't going to be a problem but the one time she was lying on an anthill and i got out the car walked around to take photographs of it and instead of charging me she got up and she just ambled towards me now when she's charging, you know why she's charging, you know what it's about, so you know how to deal with it and whatever. Now she's just coming, strolling up towards you. You sort of think, and now what's next? And she literally, she came right up to me. She stood about a meter away, looked me up and down like this, and then walked on again. Insane, absolutely insane. And a lot of it has to do with eye contact. Um, I had a, a lion that I filmed here on Malilangwe Reserve in Zimbabwe. And I'd been with her, I filmed her for about two years as well. And the one day I drove up to her and she went down in this crouch. And I stopped about five meters from her and she crouched there looking at me. And so I thought, okay, okay I'm going to try something. I'm going to look at her. So I stared at her and she stared back at me. And you know, when a lion stares at you, those eyes go straight through you. It's bloody scary. So I was staring at her and then she, her tail started twitching. And I thought, eesh, that's a problem. A lion's tail twitching means she's getting really hacked off. So I, you know, I realized that one leap should be in the car from five meters away. That's easy enough. 
So I, all I did was I closed my eyes and I opened them again, just slowly. And when I opened my eyes, she rolled onto her back. <laughs> I hadn't done anything else, nothing. That's all it took. It was amazing. And it just shows you, you know, we read everything in our eyes. Eyes are like LED screens to our brains. And that's where it's all, all happening. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that to, to understand. And, uh, <laughs> but with those leopards, I mean, I eventually was with the youngsters. I was playing with them, climbing trees with them. We were having a party. It was amazing. But it is incredible what you're talking about. And I think it was something I, I wanted to touch on later, but I think it's a really opportune moment now is, is, is two things. One is how the outdoor rejuvenates our soul and also how much it teaches us. I, I, I remember the first time I did a hike in South Africa, the Otter Trail, and I wasn't in that good a, a space when I did it. Um, and I, I saw it more as a challenge than an experience where I did the day's hike and I, was, I loved the hike, but it was always about getting to the hut at the end of the day and setting up camp. And then I did uh, another five day trail recently where it was, if I got to the hut before sunset, I was really annoyed at myself because I hadn't actually rejuvenated along the, along the day's trail. What is it that you think is that the outdoor does to us as human beings? Why does it rejuvenate us? Why is, why is it such a special place? Um, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a part of, we, we are a part of nature. We can't get away from that. You know, we, we're not robots. We're not anything of, you know, that's, a, so this is a part of, of what we essentially are. And if we try and break away from that, we lose all that connection. Then I think we, we've just, our bodies can't handle it. And, and especially our minds. You know, we need to, it slows us down for one. And, you know, the rat race that's going on out there is insane. Thanks for COVID, everybody slowed down a bit. Um, but it's, it, the pace is, you know, out here the pace is very different. And although people, you know, guides will tell you, and a lot of people think that, you know, walking in the bush in Africa is extremely dangerous. You're going to be on edge all the time. It's got to be scary. I walk out here, as I say, I run most days. I sleep under a bush. I wouldn't be sleeping if I was absolutely terrified and stressed. So it's, it's not the, the, the stressful place many people think it is. It is there to revitalize us and just to bring peace into our system. And how it does that, I don't know. It's just one of those things that it does. And, you know, you can show, you can show in of nature wildlife plants trees landscapes and they'll be in awe no matter who you show um it's just something that's innate in us and and we need it and we we can't do without it so so let's um let's understand a bit more about that in 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 practicality terms so can you describe a, a day in the life of kim what does what does it look like where where do you live What's home life look like for you? What does your day normally look like? Okay, it's probably more should be what does my night look like? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because most of my subjects are nocturnal. So yeah, that changes the whole dynamic. So I usually leave camp at around, well now in winter, about four in the afternoon. And I'll be out right through the night and I'll get back to camp the next morning, anything between nine, 10 and 11. So I'll spend the whole night out there. I will get some sleep, but you know, I'll be following whatever my subject is um, as closely as I can or finding stuff to follow. So that'll be my night out there. And then when I get back, I have to download all my footage, charge up batteries and all of that. And we've got a, our camp here is, I don't think you've ever seen a camp like this. It's very different. It's, um, it's a double story for starters, but it has, the first meter is corrugated iron. The next meter is open. It's just gauze. We don't have windows. It's just, it's like a chicken hop. 
<laughs> that chicken pen all the way around. And then upstairs is the same again, one meter corrugated down and then open. Uh, so it's a very open plan thing, very simple, airy and nice and cool in summer and freezing in winter. So that's what we come back to every day. Um, supplies are main supplies are two hours drive away. As I said, we're on a satellite connection here. So Wi-Fi has to come from satellite because we don't have phone signal. And I, my, I mean, I get a main meal, Saskia, my wife cooks a main meal that we eat at around three in the afternoon. But for, for when I'm out there, I make a smoothie. That's my supper and breakfast. And my smoothie is the best. It's, it's dates, banana, oats, um, mass, sour milk, yeah. raw eggs, and peanut butter, Jeez. and a bunch of ice. So it's like ice cream in the bush. <laughs> oh, it's the best thing. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask. No, it's yummy. Yeah, no, no, that. That, that keeps me, I mean, and it gives you a lot of oomph that, yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's a good smithy. So you, you mentioned you, there's, a, there's a few women in your life. Um, you obviously married, got a, a young, youngster and, and two older ones, and you've got another lady in your life, Joni, I understand. <laughs> Joni's always been in my life from since I was born, yes. <laughs> so who, who's Joni? <laughs> So, so Joan was my mom. So my mom, my mom was an amazing mother. My dad died when I was five. So my mom had to raise three boys. Now, three boys in 18 months because I'm a twin. So she had to raise us on her own and she did a fantastic job of that. She was hard in the nicest way. And so I thought, well, I've got this car. It goes, does everything for me. It's 32 years old, it's a Toyota Hilux, and it's still going. So I thought I had to name her Joni. <laughs> I've spent, I worked out on a, an absolute minimum, I worked out, I spent no less than 35,000 hours in Joni, <laughs> which is quite a, quite a few hours, yeah. So she really is, and you know, I've had many experiences with her. I've been hit by an elephant cow, hit me six times on the front. An elephant bull just came out of nowhere and pushed, actually pushed the car backwards. I had to push start it backwards and I managed to reverse away. Um, I've had a buffalo on this, the passing, the, my driver's door in the back there, there's two holes where a buffalo hit me. So she's, and a rhino's hooked her up the front, but she's been around and she doesn't <laughs> look, doesn't look so sexy anymore. But she's still functional, and that's all that counts. At 32 years old, she's been around. That is spectacular. Yeah. And then, how does your, how does Saskia, your wife, and your daughter, how how do they find the life that you lead in the bush camp? And uh, do you do you have any luxuries that you uh, allow yourselves to have? Well, luxury is a very relative term, I suppose. Yeah. Um, luxury of hot water we have. That's quite a luxury. <laughs> yeah, good old and running water. <laughs> yeah, and we have running water. Um, electricity is not such a luxury. It comes and goes, so we have a bit of solar, but when there is electricity, we get a bit of that. Um, but Saskia's, oh, she loves it out. And Kiki, for well, she doesn't know anything different. She's always been out here, and she just, she just loves it. But Saskia's dad was a vet, so that's sort of in the blood there as well. And yeah, we just, we, it, I, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't change it for any other life, and I don't think she would either. Um, it's just too perfect. We. I mean, we haven't been to town now for over three months, um, but mostly because of COVID. We usually go every two months or so for a week or whatever, just to get supplies. Supplies have been a bit lean in, in trying to get now, so we, we do run out of stuff and fridge runs empty every now and then. <laughs> and 
you know, even people down the road who used to grow, when I say down the road in town, who used to grow stuff aren't allowed to sell. And so there's all sorts of strange restrictions now. But, um, and Saskia is a vegan as well. So imagine being a vegan in the bush. I have to collect her baobab leaves all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> but you knew that before you married her. I know, I know. It's, 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 I don't have a problem with it. And it's, a, it's a good diet, except I do, I do still eat my meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's, uh, a lot of our audience are big photographers. They, they love getting out there and, and seeing it. And um, I, love, I love one of your quotes, which is, um, it's not about the camera. What, what do you mean by that? Um, you know, getting an image, the problem is that I've, especially me, because, you know, everything I do is behind the camera or in front of the camera. So somewhere there's a camera involved in everything I do. And I find that I'm, I do, I miss, I miss so much. I miss everything. I'm not, I'm not experiencing it for what it is. Um, so it's not about the camera. It's, it doesn't, you know, it's not about having the best camera in the world means you're going to get the best images. Not at all. I've posted piles of images on Instagram and I, I said, well, with my cell phone. And that was the Samsung, you know, S4 or something way back then. So there's no doubt it's, it's not about the camera. You, it, you've got to get in there. And I always say to guys, photographers who are wanting to get out and learn and stuff, I say, learn the rules, but only once you've learned the rules can you break them. And you have to break them. If you don't break them, you won't be a good photographer. Forget it. And I, I know I've seen it. I won the egg for award years ago and the organizer said to me after the awards and stuff that the photographic club were complaining that they never win awards and um, the reason is that they do everything by the book they don't know how to break the rules so there's no creativity in their images i think it's changing now with digital it's made a big difference but in those early days when we were shooting on film people just weren't being creative and uh, you could see it in their images. So, yeah, it's, it's really not about the camera and it's placing yourself in the right spot to get that image, spending time to get the image, all of those things. It's, it, uh, you can't just throw a camera out there and hope for the best. I do that. I chuck out a GoPro and leave it there and hope to come back for amazing images, but they don't always happen. Um, I love that tip uh, already about learn the rules, and then once you've learned them, it gives you the right to, to break them. But what other, what other tips would you give aspiring photographers and filmmakers who are, who are listening to this and going, in 20 years' time, five years' time, 10 years' time, I'd love to do this? What, what kind of tips would you give them? I think, I think what, what people, when they see what i'm doing not so much my images but when they see what i'm doing it's they want to do that not so much it's not so much as being the photographer or being the filmmaker they want to live the life that i leave that i live which is a it's a pretty special life and um i don't take it for granted and i i'm you know, i'm grateful for every day that i can spend out here so a lot of it is you know how do you get to do what i do and you know, I have to tell you that I, I've just been really lucky in, in so many ways and every step leads to something else. Of course, I, you know, I, I learn from each one and I try and take advantage of that one to get to the next one. But I have been lucky. You know, I never, I, I left school, I did a, a BSc in grassland science and then my first job was managing a game farm in Botswana. My second job was warden of a nature reserve in Swaziland. I never had any inclination to be a photographer or a filmmaker. I'd never thought of it as a career. I didn't understand it. I never looked into it. And then Richard Goss, who was at school with me, he was a year ahead of me, he called me up one day and he said, do you want to go filming? And I said, no, why would I want to do that? And at the time, I had just caught 
the legal advisor to the board, the National Parks Board in Swaziland. I just caught him poaching on the reserve. I had dirt on the, on the chairman of the board and they were giving me a really hard time. And so I thought, well, why hang around here? Let me just go and try out this filming thing. And so I did and I, I worked with Richard. The first project we did was called The Sisterhood on um, hyenas in Okavango. And then the next project was brown hyenas, Strandwolf, on the Luderitz coast. And Richard took me to Luderitz. He gave me six rolls of film. Now, I hadn't shot anything up to this stage. All I was doing was assisting him with the likes on the other project. He said, there's six rolls of film. Go for it. And I ended up shooting just about that whole project. And I've been shooting ever since. So I have to thank Richard for getting me into this industry. And I spent six years working with him. And then I went on my own. And when I did that, I... I had very little exposure to other people in the industry. And there was a filmmaker in, in the Kruger National Park doing a film on hornbills, Martin Kolbeck. So I, I happened to meet him and I was chatting to him and telling him what I was doing and how I was doing that. I wasn't that happy and stuff. And that he said to me after our evening, he said, well, I think you should stay where you are. You're on a good wicket. And for some reason, I didn't listen to him. <laughs> and so, so I left Richard and I went to overseas to go and try and sell, to try and commission a film. Uh, a survival in Norwich, Anglia. And um, I showed them my proposal. I said, I want to do a film on jackals. Um, how about it? And they said, yeah, well, actually, we don't have any slots available right now. But come back in a year's time and maybe we'll have something. So I said, well, I've, I've got my latest film that I shot, which was Beauty and the Beasts, which I'd shot for Richard. I said, I've got my latest film here. Why don't you just watch it? So when I come back next year, you'll know, you know what I'm about and whatever. So they watched the film and they said, mm, actually, I think we've got a slot available. <laughs> and it was the fastest contract I've ever had, two months done, sorted. But it just shows you that if you don't have a product, you're a nobody. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I'm talking, you know, I'm talking 25 years ago. Um, in those days, we didn't have all the internet and everything where we can just splurge out images and show people stuff that we do and all of that. You had to have something physical to take to them. Um, so it was really tough, you know, getting going. But that was my first contact and off I went. So, I mean, I think today you've got, to, you've got to just get your stuff out there, get whatever you can onto social media, get people to see it. And as photographers, don't keep your best images hidden away on a hard drive. They don't do anything for anybody. The chance of you selling them are not very high, incredibly low, actually. And so why not show your best images, promote yourself, and then go everywhere you want to go. And I find a lot of photographers hold back their images and I, and I don't see why it's, it's pointless. Get them out there, let the world see them and then that'll take you to where you want to go. Um, that's awesome. And I think it's, it's a really important life lesson actually, not just in the photography world about actually being, being brave to show your best side and, and, and don't hold things back. But that's a, a whole nother different type of discussion. Um, like I said, you, you've been in this, um, in this game and, and been really at, at the top of what you do for decades now. Uh, what's, what's the future look like for you and, and how do you ensure that you, you stay doing the things that you want to do and, and relevant and, 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 and enjoying and keeping a smile on your face? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's so critical is that one has to change with the times and, um, you know, when I first started in this industry, films were about the animals. And, and, you know, you were out there to record all the best animal behavior and to put out a nice story. And it was just about that. <clears throat> and it's changed now. And especially what I do, because I'm trying to promote hyenas. Obviously, I'm in front of the camera quite a bit. Um, so, so that's changed that whole dynamic. But also, I feel that um, 
I've lost my train of <laughs> um, let, oh, Harley, so the phones have changed. It's you know it, the, the whole industry has changed, and and thankfully I've I've been able to to keep up with the changing times. I know some really really good filmmakers who can't sell anything today because they're still trying to sell that old traditional film. And what's also changed is that films are not just about the animal's behavior. It's now all about conservation. And we have to put out films that are helping conservation in whatever way we can, because we've got to save what we can. It's not, it's not going to be there forever. So we have to do the best and we have to promote everything. Um, and, you know, in the past, if you put out a film on conservation, nobody would, it was just boring. You wouldn't listen to it. But because I mean, like I now engage with hyenas, people find that fascinating and I can put messages across um, that I wouldn't have been able to do in the past. Um, so I'm now going to be working on a 52 part series. We're doing a half hour show a week, which is all filmed by me about me making my next film hmm. and including the family. And my car is kitted out with six GoPros. And whenever I get out the car, I've got two cameras with me. One's a little stabilized one and the other's my Bill's camera. Um, so I'm recording everything all the time to put these together. And the beauty of that is it's about my life as a filmmaker and about me making this film about honey badgers. Yeah, not hyenas, believe it or not. It's about <laughs> honey badgers. I haven't seen too many yet. <laughs> um, and but while I'm doing that, you know, I'm encountering all this other stuff around. So I can, you know, find a bush and tell people about this bush or see some animal over there and explain about that and bring in conservation issues. And, you know, as I was saying, you can't, you can't put conservation issues in movies because people fall asleep. But if you're bringing little bits and pieces into that. So I think this, this series has got incredible diversity and it should have a, you know, a nice good reach in that it, and have impact and that's where we've got to go with our film we've got to have impact and sometimes it's the impact is just getting people to love what they see and and i think me with hyenas people love what they see they are sitting up and listening i don't know if you saw that <clears throat> on lad bible they put up a clip of kiki my little daughter with hyenas <laughs> and it went viral it had over a million views on it but if you saw the comments everybody had serious issues with it and you know they said that this the, this kid must be taken away to social workers because the parents are not treating well and all sorts of strange stuff and all of that is because people don't understand hyenas they know nothing about hyenas what they've been fed about hyenas they learned from the lion king and so they're now putting that onto me and making me look like the monkey but actually i know what i'm doing and she's perfectly safe so these are the things we've got to you know bring in and try and dispel and promote and hyenas are a big one that need a serious promoting agenda and a pr thing and i'm i'm doing as much of that as i can yeah and i, I was, keep doing it i was very lucky i went to the kruger uh december and um went out beautiful game driving about four five, five in the morning came across this this uh clan of hyenas with four or five cubs and they all just came, the cubs came to the car and they just start eating and nibbling and chewing on the car. And it was just, just beautiful to see that engagement interaction. It was, it was spectacular. Oh, lovely. You're lucky they didn't pop your tires for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> would have been another story that would have been. Um, yeah. We're going to move, I'm, I'm, I'd like to come back to conservation, but I want to put you on the spot a little bit with our quick fire round. So I know this is the bit that you've been dreading. This is the the either or there's no sitting on the fence this is jump in with both feet and the river is not an option for you to escape so you are stuck you're handcuffed to the chair now okay so i just close my computer <laughs> <laughs> so uh, either or questions are we ready to go right okay my son's my son's put a few in here as well so if they're if they're difficult ones you can blame a 10 year old um Lion or hyena? Uh, 
So you just want yes and no. Yes just or no. Pick, pick one. Lion or hyena? Hyena. Beer, wine, or whiskey? Uh, beer, but I don't drink. Winter or summer? <laughs> uh, summer. Meat or veg? Both. Oh, you can't have both. There's no probably, both answers. Probably veg then. I can't just live on meat. <laughs> Canon or Nikon? Oh, of course. Canon. <laughs> Zim or South Africa? Oh, hands down, Zimbabwe. Uh, herbivores or carnivores? Uh, I'll go with carnivores, I think. It's yeah. a tough one. <laughs> uh, rhino or elephant? Elephant. Uh, spontaneous or planned? Spontaneous. Yeah, this is an easy one for you considering, Joni. Toyota or Ford? <laughs> yeah, no, Hilux. Yeah, <laughs> Toyota. Reading a book or watching a movie? I, I, I love reading a book. I love reading because but I fall asleep, that's the problem. <laughs> but definitely a book gives you a lot more than the movie. It does. Sunrise or I sunset? Um, rise. Um, a road trip or a plane trip? Road. Solo adventure or group adventure? I'm quite a solo guy, yeah. Okay. Leopard or cheetah? Leopard. And just because of my son, soccer or rugby? <laughs> Neither. Soccer, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but uh, on that, you know, you were asking about um, a book, book or a movie. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've often said that I would rather be a photographer than a filmmaker. And the reason for that is I believe that the, the, the image just says so much more than, than the movie. And, you know, when, you, when you're shown a movie, you sit back on the couch like a useless vegetable and you watch this and you're fed with whatever. At all. You've just got to, you just take in this junk, whatever it is. Whereas with, a, with an image, you look at it and you, so many thoughts go through your mind of what happened then, what did this do, what did that do? It's, it's so much more creative. And that's why the book, reading a book is always better than seeing the movie because your mind is so much more trying to, you know, get to grips with the whole thing. And it's the same with photography. So I would rather be a photographer, but maybe I'm not good enough to be a photographer, but also making a living out of photography is, is not that easy at all. Mm. Well, I'm so excited. The, uh, your 52 part series that you, you mentioned earlier, that is going to be the top of the thing that I'm going to be watching. So um, just, just purely for my selfish reasons and nothing to do with the tens of hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be listening to this now, where, when, when can I watch it and where do I watch it? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I don't know at the moment. We, we're going to start shooting hopefully next month. Um, the, first, the first series of 13 will only be out in four months' time. So, well, that's when they'll be finished. So when they get to air, you know, probably only the end of the year or so. I'll have to keep you updated with that. And it'll be distributed worldwide. So it'll be on many different networks. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I just want to, there's a, a great story I read about, about you. And you've, you've talked a little bit about some, some really cool ideas and tips for helping, helping people take their passion and make a difference. And I read a story about um, a young girl who came to, to visit you called Olivia. Um, and she's, she's gone on and, and 
Do you want to tell the story? Because I think it's, it's part for me as I, I think about what you've, you've done for, for me and, and my generation as we've grown up watching and being influenced by what you've brought to us. And, and this is a great story about how you've actually touched somebody. And if you don't mind sort of finishing off about the story with Olivia and tying it into what do you hope your legacy is going to be? Well, Olivia, she's just an amazing little girl. You know, she was, so I, I never met her, but a friend of mine knew, she was 14 years old. A friend of mine knew her and she told me, listen, please, can't you help this little girl? She's 14 years old. She loves photography. She's keen on the bush and she's terminally ill. And I said, yeah, of course. And so she came along. It was the first time she hadn't stayed away from, or she, the first time that she stayed away from home with her mother. And she came and spent, you know, I think three or four days with me in my, at Mala Mala. And I asked her, in those days we were still shooting film, and I said to her, bring some pictures along so I can give you some advice, you know, what's right, wrong, whatever. So she brought some images and I showed her a few things, and then we went out. And every now and then I'd look back and I gave her all my camera gear to use. I would be filming, she's using my still stuff. And I'd look back and she just looked so professional the way she was just shooting away and doing it. And then when she left, I took her images and I processed them and they were amazing. Hmm. So I said to her, you've got to enter the um, wildlife photographer of the year competition in London. So we got some pictures together, we sent them in. And she was in the 14, the 14 year old, I think it's 10 to 14, 14 to 17 year old category. Um, and she won it. Hmm. Incredible. And then the next year she entered again and I think she got a first and second. But she is, she's a fantastic photographer. And she went on to, she did veterinary science. She's a qualified vet now. If her body wasn't producing red blood cells, so she needed to have a bone marrow transplant. And her condition was a very unusual one that very few people have around the world. Anyway, she's had, she's had a bone marrow transplant. She went through hell for a whole year in hospital and ICU and everything. She's out, she's at home and it seems like she's probably going to be fine now. But, you know, obviously that journey for her as well. I mean, what a fantastic girl. She's just, oh, she's amazing. Now, there was a hyena at, uh, in Botswana that I filmed. And this hyena used to be the matriarch. And then she got beaten up by the rest of the clan. She now walks around on her two front legs only. It's the most incredible thing to see. She tucks up her back legs underneath her. And then she does this power walk on her front legs. And Olivia came to Botswana and she, she met Mohono. She saw her and everything. And Mohono has been like that for eight years now, I think. Just surviving on her own. She's got just the, and Olivia's like that. I always tell her that she's just like Mohono and it's beautiful. And yeah, so that was, that was very special. And what a great kid. Uh, well, she's not a kid anymore. She's in her, <laughs> she's in her late twenties now. Uh, it's a great story and just the, the way it touches just brings the outdoors to reality and how it rejuvenates the soul which we touched on earlier so, so if we you and i touch base again in in 10 years time 20 years time what what would you like your legacy to be well if it's in 20 years time i'll probably i'll be 20 i'll be 81 by then so that's going to be tough going <laughs> Um, hopefully I'll still be filming then. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would like people to feel like they've, they felt a connection. I, I think it's important that they were saying earlier, just to feel that connection with, with nature, with the outdoors and be a part of it. And hopefully my films have inspired people to feel that and to get involved and and the big thing is I hope that by then hyenas are seen as the coolest animal on the planet because mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure they are.
have an animated film on hyenas coming up. Um, I'm going to make that happen one day. That's very cool. Break the Lion King myth. Yeah, exactly. We've got to slaughter the Lion King and, and no better way than to do it than, than with an animated film because Lion King is animated and you, that's what you're competing with. So I, I do believe, you know, we've, we've made so many hyena films, not just me, but other people as well. And we always trying to portray hyenas for what they are, but it's not getting out there. The message isn't, it's not, it's not, it's not getting any traction. And the reason it's not getting traction is because all our films are being broadcast on channels that people who are interested in wildlife will watch, but they already know about hyenas. So we're not converting them, but the masses, who don't know about hyenas have seen the Lion King. So their sense, their knowledge of hyenas is completely warped. And I believe the only way, I mean, imagine making a film on hyenas, an animated one. And think about all films are about male domination. Now you make a film that's about female domination. An animated film on hyenas that's about field domination, single moms, serious hunters, highly intelligent, all of that. And they're humorous. And they've got their own humor because they laugh as well. It's a no-brainer, surely. It's and especially win -win. in these times. So it's got to happen. It's Definitely. got to happen. Hyenas need it. <laughs> so all the movie producers out there wanted to fund an animated hyena movie, then uh, you know who to speak to. Yes, exactly. Um, we always give our guests the opportunity where, where we give them that the power minute where they're able to share anything that they want to share with, with the audience, talk about anything that you want to talk about. So instead of me asking you questions, we're going to give you a minute. Um, and considering what you do for the outdoors, you can have as long as you want to share, to share anything that you'd like the audience to, to leave with or or think about or do or behave differently. So the microphone is all yours. Okay, on the spot. No, I think, yeah, about three years ago, I saw a newspaper cutting or a, this thing on News 24, a kid had been taken by a hyena in the Kruger National Park. Um, he was camping at Crocodile Bridge and this hyena came in and grabbed him. But they managed to chase the hyena away and he was off into hospital and stuff. And I never saw any, any more, there was no more media about the whole thing again. It was completely hushed. And just by chance, I met somebody who said, I know, do you know about this kid who was bitten in Krieger? I said, yeah, I heard it, but there's no more. I said, no, no, he's our neighbor. So I phoned up his mother and organized to go and see them. And she, she, was, she was a bit skeptical because they had on purpose kept away all media. They didn't want any media coverage because it made their whole experience far too negative. So I went and I, I, went and I visited them and this was Erko van Rensburg. No, is it van Erko? Oh. Why can I not remember his surname? Anyway, Erko. Erko was 14 years old. And now his mom's telling me the story. And this kid, so they were camping. They had a caravan. And you know you have that, that cover that goes up from a caravan. He yeah. was sleeping there on a stretcher. Now, the, the campsite is fenced. But there was a hole in the fence. And he was sleeping there. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, a hyena came through the hole and grabbed him on the face and dragged him off. And he didn't scream, he didn't make, didn't utter anything, which is quite amazing. His uncle who was sleeping in a tent nearby, heard a noise, walked out and found this and chased the hyena away. So now he's lying on his mother's lap. He's, this side of his face is pulled right over, completely open. And everybody's screaming and he says it to his mother in a very calm voice, mom, please, can you just, get everybody to stop screaming. And then uh, they managed to organize a helicopter and they cazavacked him to Nelspreet. And on the, in the, he'd never been in a helicopter before and all he wanted to do was sit up and see where they were going. <laughs> but the, the medics wouldn't allow him to. Uh, and then they cazavacked him to, 
to Pretoria. And he was in ICU there. And the after the, the surgeons had worked on him, I think they did they did three operations, a total of ten hours. Um, he lost his eye, but they managed to reconstruct his whole face. And the surgeon came out of there and went to the parents and said, "Listen, this is it's going to be a long haul. He's going to be here for a very long time before we can you know, let him out." And he was in ICU for 17 days. And then he said to his mom, mom, I want to go home. And she says, no, my boy, you can't go home. It's going to be a long time still. And the next thing she looks, there he is on the floor doing (laughs) push-ups. So they discharged him the next day. (laughs) And um, so I went to see him. And there's our Erko. He's got, yeah, he doesn't have an eye and he's got all these scars, but his mother's got this special cream that she puts on and she said, yeah, no, the the scars will all go. And he says, oh, Mark, can I just keep one scar, please? (laughs) And so Erko, the previous year, he had won the world championships in karate in his age group. Skinny little guy just went out there and won the world champs. So I said to him, now, now what, can, what are you going to do now? You can't do contact sports anymore. He says, no, I'm training karate again. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> no, he's training. And um, so the, I think it was the following year he went to the world champs. And he, he wore a special mask. All his teammates from South Africa all wore an eye patch like he did. <laughs> And I think he he got a he did he got two bronzes, which is which is amazing. But the amazing part is that this kid has no grudge for hyenas. He realizes and is fully understanding of the fact that the reason the hyena came and bit him and came in there is because people feed them, and the people are the wrong things. So that's why the family keeping the press away and keeping the whole thing positive has been so good and you know he doesn't he's not even scared of hyenas anymore i still want to get him out here to come and see my hyenas and just experience it but what an amazing kid and yeah just a phenomenal guy i see it says our connection is unstable no we we got everything and that was it's a it's a phenomenal story about again it's the the negativities of human interaction with animals but also the positivity of if you understand and respect both spaces, how, how incredible this world can be. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, just what a great kid. It's, yeah, well, both of them, Olivia and him, fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's a great story. And I've, I think I've got, I've, I've only gone through a third of the questions I wanted to go through, but we, and we probably could talk for another two or three hours at least, but I'm, I'm conscious that you probably need to, to get some food in you and you need to, to head out and start, start meeting um, your friends yeah. again. Indeed, got to get out there, yeah. So I am um, going to say just a, a massive thank you for, for your time, your insights, and, and more importantly, for, for everything you do in bringing the, the outdoors and bringing the bush and bringing nature into people's lives. So they, truly get to understand the power the beauty and the benefit of being respectful and at one so for everything you've done and thank you for for helping me grow up and one of the reasons why we get outdoors is such a a big part is is your work that you've done and how you've influenced me over the last two decades so kim it's been probably one of the top 10 things i've done is to to chat to you so a, a massive thank you for joining Cheers, Mark. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, man. All the best. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth, and become part of a tribe of like minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips, and insights and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. 
click on the link in the description below to join for free right now.